G'day guys, this is going to be on gluconeogenesis. I'll just start this up. First of all, I'll share the screen. Um, this is Paul Mason in one of his recent um, videos. I just sat through and just watched it a second ago. I just finished watching it. Um, there's, there's a few points that I want to touch on it in that regard. So this is one of the points. I'll just go through it. But uh, just on the whole MCT thing there, I really don't like people chasing ketones. And I... Obviously, neither do I. Um, I think that that's not the goal in that regard. I think this is particularly relevant for athletes like Sean. Uh... So he's talking about athletes like Sean Baker um, and others that it's not a good idea. And so, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the higher, um, you know, sort of glucose levels or um, the... Um, who, to be fair, you've come in for some heat for your HbA1c. So he's just talking about the HbA1c, which is basically the glycation of red blood cells um that is higher um that's there's a couple of reasons for that one if you have more gluconeogenic precursors you will basically produce more and because the actual resident time of the actual red blood cells is longer because they get less damaged in a sense tends to they tend to stay around far longer on a ketogenic state which means that they will get a bit extra glycation, but it's not really what is circulating. So when you actually do a blood test to look at circulating, you know, and you know, your blood sugars on a carnival diet are pretty flat, which is one, one thing. And so you get this misreading in that regard. So that's part of it, but that's not the main point that I want to actually touch on this. And I think we can explain that quite simply. And part of the explanation relies on understanding exactly what ketones are and how they're produced. So I think a low state, a low level of ketosis is perfectly healthy. But I and that's what you know I support as well. That uh, we want a low state of ketosis, like the Maasai, like the Inuit, and all that. And that comes from eating more meat getting that protein in. I think when it gets to excessive levels of ketosis, and that would be anything over two or three, I think that reflects impaired gluconeogenesis, which- And that's true. It does reflect re impaired gluconeogenesis, obviously. Um, this is why people produce very high ketones and run very high ketones when they don't get enough sufficient protein in the diet. For an athlete trying to perform is not going to be very good. So let me explain how it all works. Okay, so what Paul's going to give us is a bit of a rundown on the way he views this. I'm going to actually go into it as well shortly. So the reason your body produces ketones requires something called oxaloacetate to be depleted from the citric acid cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And that's the reason the oxaloacetate gets depleted is because it's used. So that's one step before where you've got um, CoA that comes in from whether pyruvate or glycolysis. And then you need basically that in, to support that, to make that happen, um, oxaloacetate, okay? So that's a critical step there. And that's what he's talking about, that if you don't have enough, you can't support the actual TCA cycle. And as a consequence, then you divert more fatty acids towards ketones, increasing ketone production in gluconeogenesis. 
So if you don't have enough carbohydrate coming in, your body will say, oh crap, we need to make sugar. We need it for something. And you'll go through this pathway of gluconeogenesis. And then if that depletes your oxalate acetate supply, that means that if you have more acetyl-CoA coming into the citric acid cycle, and that can be um, from fatty acid oxidation. So that's so you get how these repeat people will actually talk about, oh, too many free fatty acids, you know, having an effect on, you know, on gluconeogenesis, you know, not enough sugar and stuff like that. So they use this argument. We have to be very careful. Paul um, is just talking sort of general to explain and all that, but this in a, by reductionists can be very much hijacked or they can be, can be used against us. So you're starting to burn fat now that acetyl-CoA is coming into the citric acid cycle. Without enough oxalate acetate, it can't cycle around. Exactly, so, and that's correct, it can't. So then it's that acetyl-CoA then gets diverted into the production of ketones. Exactly. So free fatty acids into ketones. So if you're having a massive level of ketones, that basically indicates impaired gluconeogenesis by way of a uh, relative deficiency of oxalate acetate. So, and that's true. For an elite athlete, especially somebody like you, Sean, you're trying to put out a huge amount of watts on the concept too there. Um, and if you want to restore your glycogen stores after the exercise, there's a number of reasons. You don't want to be running a huge level of ketones because that means that you're going to have a relatively impaired gluconeogenic response. And he's right. And that's why, you know, having high, or chasing after high ketones is a problem because you're not supporting, you know, you need to restore glycogen stores through gluconeogenesis. But if you basically, you know, are chasing ketones or throwing in ketone esters or throwing all these sort of stuff, because what you want to be basically through the TCAs, what you want to be pushing is substrates of fatty acids okay so you want to be oxidizing fats and you want to have enough acetate to basically support gluconeogenesis for the glycogen stores that you need to replete in that regard and so when you're chasing ketones like some of the crackpots out there that are promoting these high ketone levels and all that it's just not what we want guys it's not what we want we get into these impairments and then the crackpots use this as arguments against us. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's go into it. Mm. Okay, so alanine and aspartate metabolism. Okay. So here's alanine. This is glycolysis pyruvate going through here. And this is where alanine comes through, supporting these enzymatic pathways and their process. And then aspartate, aspartic acid, will run through here to replenish oxaloacetate, okay? And then basically you can go through the citric cycle um, through here, back to um, through the fumarate, malate, and back to, and remember the fumarate that I've talked about in the past in terms of when we're talking about metabolic water, when we're talking about also um, you know, I've talked about it in the past. That is for a future day. Let's see, even here, there you go. Now this is the salvage pathway. So this is, you know, the nicotinamide salvage pathway to, to restore um, basically NAD plus, you know, sort of going through the salvage pathway, you know, that I've talked about anyway. That's what that is. Just if anybody wonders, what is that? That's a salvage pathway. Anyway, that I've talked about and I've shown before in videos. So basically, you know, 
there's the support of power of eight, you know, coming through to excel uh, acetate without, without having enough, you're going to be in trouble. Now, what do you need for this? Obviously, alanine, the spartate. Foods. Now, in order to create a spartate, you need basically alanine and histidine. Okay. So we will look first at alanine. So gelatin, eggs, you know, eggs, protein. Well, that's all protein powder. So that's just crap. We know the poor bioavailability, but they've got it in there. You know, then it's all basically real foods, steaks, stuff like that, steaks, you know, turkey, ribeyes, bacon, you know, this is the stuff that basically gives you alanine. And if you look at all the studies, when you look at gluconeogenesis, all the studies use alanine as their main amino acid for gluconeogenesis in their research studies. Very important for gluconeogenesis. Then we will go to histidine, which is the other one. We'll ignore the shit powders or soy powders because we're not using isolates. We're using real foods, which is eggs, parmesan, um, you know, forget the powders. That's just all crap. Um, uh, bacon, you know, more cheeses and steaks and pork chops and ribeyes. You know, it's all the animal foods. What, what do you expect? That's where it all is, unless you're looking at processed powders. We're not looking at that. That's just man-made shit, that the modern day man-made shit full of uh, high deuterium levels. We don't want that shit. We want the animal foods that are very high in that. And then the key one that actually supports and aspartic acid, which is aspartame. Okay, so forget about that. Eggs, forget about it because it's very poor bioavailability in spirulina anyway, and you can't consume too much because it's quite toxic. So forget it, you're never, never gonna um, get any real levels there. Gelatin, which is connective tissue and stuff like that. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, the pork rinds and all that, full of that shit. Get yourself pork rinds to support gluconeogenesis. And dried eggs, so we know the rare eggs, steaks and steaks, and bacon, and ribeyes, and it goes on and on and on. So as you can see, you want to support those, eat more meat, eat more meat, and you will support the pathways that make you healthy. So... This is the problem when you listen to crackpots and basically you go on very low protein diets, you end up not able to support gluconeogenesis. And then you end up with these sort of problems where people say, well, I need to take carbohydrates because basically, you know, I'm not getting enough. You don't. It's demand driven, but you need to support it with the right nutrition. So if you're eating animal foods you're getting the amino acids that support those damn pathways and you don't have to worry you're not going to run out of acceloacetate you'll be able to support the citric cycle because you're giving the body what it needs in large quantities and animal foods are very high in these in these subs um, amino acids that are required to support that that pathway it only becomes a problem when you listen to crackpot gurus and you eat you know like multiple amounts of green leafy vegetables and crap like that and don't eat st um, uh, steak and eggs and you know and if you can tolerate dairy products and stuff like that and you're deficient in these amino acids that you need to support gluconeogenesis then you get into those problems and then you've got the crackpot showing and say look 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 they're doing it they're doing the keto diet. They're getting high ketones and they're inhibiting this um, pathway. Yeah, we know. But that's because they're idiots. They don't know what they're doing because ancestrally people didn't do that. They went after the animal. They ate fat and meat in large amounts and they loved it and enjoyed it. And they were healthy and robust and strong. And so we need to be 
not like the crackpot gurus in the low in the keto community we need to be more like the Maasai, like the inuit like those people ancestral people that loved animal fats and animal flesh that is what basically makes you strong resilient providing the materials for the body to work properly and then you don't have these problems and you don't have to um, then the, the arguments of the crackpots basically become insignificant because they are shown for what they are reductionist and illogical arguments based on looking at what crackpots are doing not what real people are doing in our community so i hope you enjoyed that on gluconeogenesis a bit of a twist on how to support it with meat eat your meat and i will see you later <laughs>